following is a account from Kent History Forum regarding Blue Town, which is in the uh, Isle of Sheppey. And this relates to the time from 1800 to 1815. A large chunk of a letter printed from N in the Guardian, September the 6th, 1862, reprinted 2nd of April, 1910. I have known the Isle of Sheppey nearly 60 years. I have only been absent at brief intervals. I must beg leave to go back to the beginning. I had a notable cradle, for I was cradled in the old sandwich. This ship figured conspicuously in the mutiny at the Nore. I was landed in the dockyard, in the then called Vile of Sheerness. My first place of residence was in Bull Lane, Blue Town. This place was so named for the number of slaughterhouses in it. The house I lived in, if such a dwelling could be so called, could not in its construction boast of a piece of wood three foot long. It was built of the chips which the artisans were allowed to bring out of the yard at that time. To such a length was the appropriation of these short lengths carried that the authorities were obliged to put a stop to it. They substituted chip money in lieu of the chips, but both forms of prerequisites are now long since abolished. After the old ships were done away with, the artisans who used to live in them were located in the large barracks called the Long Alley and the Little Alley. These buildings adjoin the present old parade. The inhabitants lived in them for some time rent free. They were afterwards raised to two storey buildings. They then had to pay rent for them and also poor rates towards supporting the poor in the dockyard workhouse. The foreman afloat was the master of the workhouse. Where the present Admiralty House stands was the ordnance store and the storekeeper's house. Close to the archway recently pulled down there stood a row of government dwellings where the present Admiral's Gardens is, and there stood the Three Tons public house, and the residences of the dockyard officials. Opposite the front of the Admiralty House was another row of dwellings belonging to the Ordnance, and also a tap house and a fish stall. The battery met right round to where the signal station is now, with the exception of the old dockyard gate, and an arch with a church built on top of it, there were steps on both sides of the arch leading up to the battery. Close by there were a few small shops that went on trucks. I remember three in particular. Cocking the tailor, Cannon the shoemaker and Craig the barber. The approach to the town was by a sally port, a seawall and a road to Blue Town called New Road. The end nearest the high street, Blue Town, was occupied by shops. The two corner shops were kept by the two Mr Greatheads. The one on the right hand had over it some small guns mounted in the year of the mutiny. Where the lower camber now is, there stood the marketplace, with shambles fitted up for butchers and poulterers. The market was well attended on Saturday, which was the regular market day, by salesmen from all over the country. One or two persons also attended occasionally during the week. And at that time, such was the high rate of wages that the artisans received 25 shillings a week to subsist on and the rest at the end of the quarter. Their wives used always to taste the fresh butter on market days with a guinea or a half guinea. The sailmakers and blacksmiths worked seven days in the week from five in the morning till ten at night. One day a blacksman, blacksmith asked for a day's leave and the master shipwright asked him what he wanted the leave for. He replied that he had four children who he had never seen by daylight and he wanted to see how they looked. From 1801 to 1806, 1806 the place was garrisoned by the army of reserve and afterwards by the militia. There were here the Cardigan and Benby and two Welsh regiments. These, I remember, had beautiful bands. 
the militia used so many of them to go into the dockyard every day to work as labourers, while the tailors and shoemakers used to make a good deal of money at their trades. There used to be fine work with parties of the military parading the town with flags flying, drums beating and plenty of drink to be had to get the men to volunteer into the line regiments after a battle. Next an Irish regiment came, a complete set of ruffians. They insulted and annoyed everyone. The artisans coming out of the yard armed themselves with their tools. There was some bad work back then, but at last they were removed. Then the garrison duty had to be done by the town volunteers, composed of Jews and Gentiles, under the command of Colonel Bishop, a grocer of the town. And during that time the place was visited by a very high tide, which did a great deal of damage. There were three feet of water at the dock gates. They feared the ships would break out of the docks. An old lady by the name of Mrs Bush was found and rescued from Upper Pear Tree on a small island at the back of which is now called Mile Town. The late Sir Isaac Coffin was the resident commissioner. One of his mild regulations was to make all the workmen living in the garrison put their lights out at eight o'clock. I perfectly recollect Admiral Lord Nelson paying a visit to the dockyard here and inspecting the antelope, then ready for launching. The Antelope was the largest ship, ship ever built in the yard, as it was then. It took the entire hands of the yard to heave a 64 or 50 gun ship by purchases or capstans. To keep the water out of the dock inside the gates, a party of men were employed called scaffiers, who stopped out the water at spring tides with red clay, etc. I dare say there are people in Sheerness who re recollect the Imperus coming into the harbour with three silver candlesticks at her masthead. The crew received upwards of £500 on the capstan and had 14 days protection from the press gang. She was commanded by the late Admiral Earl, Earl Don Donald, KCB. Jack Ashore soon made for the few public houses that were in that day all alive. There were the Upper White Horse, the Lower White Horse, the Granby's Head, the Swan, the Checkers, the Ship, the King's Head and the Fountain. And there happened to be a sale of some farms about that time. And Mr Sawyer, landlord of the Granby's Head, outbid everyone else. Justice Poor said, If the publicans make such rapid fortunes, is it time there were more of them? Then up springs the Anchor and Hope, the Hit or Miss, the Horse and Groom, the Princess Charlotte, the Nelson and the Prince Regent, where an unfortunate captain of a man-of-war brig was shot by the landlord in mistake for a housebreaker as he was trying to force his way at night into the house. In Mile Town, instead of the solitary bells and lion, up sprang the Wellington, the Crown, the Britannia, the Victory, the True Britain, the Sun, the Jolly Sailor, the Carpenter's Arms, Bricklayer's Arms, Shipwright's Arms, and others which continue up to this day, with a little host of beer shops. I was one of the scholars at Mr Herbert's school. With Mr Fuller, Mr Brightman, Mr Clarkson and the sons of the Russian Admiral. The Russian fleet was then laying here for protection from Napoleon. Besides, these were there the Barlings and the Ushers and the Tuckers and many more who now show the ravages of time and are grandfathers and great-grandfathers. Sometime later, when the Admiralty wanted to enlarge the dockyard, the north sides of Blue Town, standing on their ground, the houses were all taken down and most of them removed to Mile Town. Edward Street has taken the place of the well and farm belonging to Mr Chalk. The first new row of houses that was built was called Naval Row. When the ground was wanted, where the artisans lived in the garrison, they moved into Mile Town and Blue Town. The Admiral gave the parish of Minster a sum of money to take charge of their poor and abolish their workhouse. During my absence at sea, the new docks, basins, etc. were finished by Sir Edward Banks and were opened by the late William IV, then Duke of Clarence, with great pomp and display.